What is gamification? For me, gamification is uh, the use of game elements in non-game contexts. In other words, gamified systems are analog and digital environments enriched by game elements to nudge users towards a certain desired set of activities or behavior. Yeah? So it's not about playing games in gamification. It's about learning from games. Yeah? So we analyze existing games on the market that are super successful. We try to understand why they are su so successful. We extract the motivational structure that is behind it and put it into the real world to solve real world uh, problems. So we learn from games. We are not playing games. We enrich the reality, analog or digital, by game elements. The user normally is not aware that he or she is currently you know, using a gamified system. So the user would say, I currently do not play a game. Well, somehow it feels like it. I, I, I recognize some game elements into it. But it doesn't feel like a game itself, like a game as you know it as game developers. Yeah? On the other hand, we have serious games, yeah? which is, for me, a game designed for a primary purpose other than pure entertainment. In other words, a serious game serves an environment for intended learning, awareness raising, or behavior change without direct consequences in the real world. Yeah? The player would say now, yes, I am playing a game right now. Oh, that's a serious game? What is a serious game? So the, the, the player is aware that he or she is currently playing a game. They're in this protected magic circle. However, they do not necessarily need to know that this is a serious game. Uh, it might influence them in a way somehow. It might teach them something. It might raise the awareness on a brand, for instance. Uh, but they don't need to know that it is a serious game. In serious games, we have here this wonderful magic circle that you're probably aware of as, as gamers, where we have on the left-hand side the learner, and he or she is entering that magic circle, and they try and fail in the magic circle. So they can try out different things, without having consequences in the real world. And that is such a powerful learning environment, yeah? where you can try and fail and just do again, learn from your mistakes and redo it without consequences in the real world. Furthermore, you can be someone else. You, know? you can try out how does it feel to be the bad guy. Yeah? Normally, you don't dare to, to, to really react as the bad guy. But here, you can really try it out and see how are the people reacting if I play as the bad guy. So all the things that we're doing here within that magic circle first stays in the magic circle because we don't have consequences in the real world. However, if the learner is leaving that magic circle, he or she will transfer the learnings into real life. What you can see here now is basically um, overlapping circles. So it's not always 100% clear what is gamification, what are serious games, what are entertainment games, but quite often uh, it's worth giving it a shot. So gamification for me are environments enriched by game elements. So it's digital or analog world. On serious games, we have games with a primary purpose other than pure entertainment. And then on the right hand side, we know the entertainment games that are made to, you know, mainly um, entertain the people, make money with monetization um, mechanics that you... All right, so I was just speaking about like uh, the difference between uh, gamification series games and entertainment games, how I do understand. Okay, how it all started. So basically, 2015, uh, we after, after exploring the topic and doing a lot of research on it, we actually had a hackathon running by GRZ, so German Development Corporation Agency, and we invited a lot of um, participants, musicians, artists, and stuff from Africa to Ethiopia, and we had the first hackathon here on gamification for social good. So we were exploring the topic, and we had a lot of fun, as you can see here on that picture. We, we discovered a lot of you know, how powerful this approach can be, how people are motivated through game elements to solve real-world problems, but then we also made a lot of mistakes because after the hackathon was over, 
like the, the, the fire that was burning, the motivation that was high, we didn't follow up on this. Yeah? So this was a big mistake that we were doing. And we thought, OK, we need to structure this. And this is the first uh, outcome that I want to share with you, that I'm structuring the projects right now always like this. Perhaps you know the RD model. So basically, it consists of very regular project management steps like analysis, then design the solution or conceptualize the solution, develop the solution. For instance, if you th uh, talk about a game, do the coding, the illustrations, whatever implement the game or publish the game, and then evaluate it. Of course, evaluation should not only take, or should not only begin when you're basically at the end of it, um, and only by after publishing, but already at the beginning, you can do a lot of impact measurement um, activities. And what, is, what you see here on the right-hand side is something that I call experience management, because everything here is about experiences for the user. Yeah? And I'm mixing a lot of different approaches here on the right-hand side and frameworks that I use to have a solution at the end that is adapted to the culture and the context. I always start with an adapted design thinking approach. I don't know if you know about design thinking. It's basically a human-centered design where you put the user into the middle uh, of your design. Yeah, so you try to put yourself into the shoes of the user. You speak to a lot of people that will be your target group, and you always go for this user-centered design. Nice, uh, a nice sound, actually. And um, so uh, the target group and the context is of highest importance here. Yeah? And too many projects are skipping this phase. They just say that we have a great idea. We will do it. I know my target group. I know the context. Let's go for it. Don't fall into that, that pitfall, yeah? So really don't skip this analysis phase. It is so important because you're normally not designing for yourself. You want to design your solution for a specific target group. So don't skip the analysis phase. Then also you do the design, and there you know a lot of different things come into place. Design thinking also helps you with ideation, out-of-the-box ideas, but here also serious game design, gamification design, usability, user experience, all these things are things that are go hand in hand. Yeah? So you don't need to isolate uh, these, these approaches. You can combine them. And then finally, to really get the things done, you go for agile project management, whatever fits for your team, Scrum, Kanban, whatever is out there, to really get things done. Yeah. We did uh, also, uh, we started basically, or we continued our journey then in Egypt. And we had uh, great partners in Egypt where we established actually, I think, 14 serious games on the blue color labor market. So basically, we had a huge problem that there was a gap between the employees and the employers. Yeah? And we wanted to build the trust of it. So we wanted to improve the quality of the employees, or basically what you can see here is a, is a hyper-casual game on job preparation. So when you go for the first time job interview, what do you do? You know, um, are you on time? Are you, you know, dressed accordingly and stuff? So basically we, we, we taught, uh, we, we had a, a PDF document of consisting of 80 pages that was a job preparation manual. And this job preparation manual was so boring <laughs> that never, no one ever read, you know? And we decided that we want to have this manual translated into a series of games. So people can really interact with the learning content. And that is also adapted to yeah, the target group, to the audience, the youth. Yeah? Um, yeah, we went for different experiences, like uh, hyper-casual, PC, VR, and stuff. Another one was on human rights. Yeah? Human rights in Egypt um, was also very interesting topic to talk about here. We have like a, a narrative that you basically you wake up in the desert. You don't know why you are in the desert. You meet up with the, the, the group of people there, and you have to survive by respecting each other. You can do meaningful choices in the game. For instance, this little kid here, what you can see, um, might not survive if you decide in the one way or the other. So here we were heavily inspired by Telltale Games, The Walking Dead, perhaps you know that. Uh, we applied it here as well. <laughs> we didn't have zombies, but um, also a lot of meaningful choices on human rights. 
then I found out that whew, we have a lot of power with games. We are influencing, as game designers, through the game, our player heavily. You know? The player is not really aware of this, because if the game is designed properly, the player, he or she, feels in total control of their activities. They think that they decide what they're doing. But that's not the case. We design this system. We design this world, and we say what is right or what is wrong to do. We give them feedback. And with this feedback, we influence the player. Yeah? So here we speak about ethics in games. Yeah? Ethics, it's, it's a very important topic that will in the next years will be of, uh, of, of, of more importance, I'm quite sure because people need to know that they're heavily influenced by games. And basically, you influence or you design the game. The game influences the player. And the player afterwards influences the reality. Yeah. So through the game, you can have a huge audience of players that are then afterwards you know, transferring the learnings from the games, but also the behaviors, and transfer it from the games into the real world. You ha we have to be aware of this. OK, another example that I want to show you is uh, that we were doing a serious game on tourism for sustainable development in Africa. And this was the first uh, cross-African serious game that was developed So here uh, yeah, in cooperation with DLZ, so German Development Corporation, then four different game studios from Africa, and here my company from Germany, so we created um, this, this game called Mama Atingi Shop, and basically it puts you in the shoes of a, of a, um, yeah, of a shop owner, and you are trying to sell your goods. And through a very playful approach, you learn about stuff like yeah, basic economics, yeah? seasonality, yeah? and when like different types of customers that require different things of items and assets that you need to have. Yeah? So in a very playful way and very addictive uh, way of, of, of playing, people are aware what they should do. <laughs> OK. I think I can continue. So the thing is that um, you, you put the user into the shoes of a shop owner. And of course, we were also targeting the shop owners themselves. Yeah? So they can try out to, to behave in the right way. And also, price building, for instance, yeah, is a topic they, don't, they did intuitively. But there's a structured way to do price building. Yeah? And we, we linked it to a learning course, to a learning platform. So uh, if they want to learn more about price building, they're kicked out of that serious game to a learning platform to earn a mini certificate over there, like taking a course on price building that takes around one hour. And when they complete it, they can go back to the game with unique items they earn in the learning course. Another one we just published uh, a couple of weeks ago or a month ago um, is a serious game on good governance in cooperation with the African Union. So what we did here is the African Union wanted to promote their instruments also to show the importance of the African Union to the African inhabitants. Yeah? So like people that are living in Africa, why should there be something like the African Union? 98% of people don't know why it is, of, it, it, is, it is of importance. And we tried to change this with that uh, serious game here. Yeah? So we used the storytelling approach. While I was designing that game, I was heavily influenced by Hades, the game. I don't know if you know it. Yeah? So basically, it follows the same approach here. but. Um, is basically making use of the different, not the power ups from Hades that, uh, that Hades or like the people in Hades give you, but here from the African Union. Uh, so you have the different tools of the African Union, and you need to use them in, over, uh, in order to overcome challenges in this fictitious um, continent called Anaka. What did we learn from this? I also want to share something with you. I'm not sure if it's big enough. I will 
guide you through it, and you will probably, um, it will remind you of a lot of different uh, frameworks probably. For instance, the flow theory is embedded in this one here as well. What you can see here is on the bottom the play time that the user is going through, and here the player skill level or the competency that the, the player has. Yeah? And we have like five different steps that we need to think about as a designer. So don't fall into the pitfall of just designing one single game. You need to be aware that the player will evolve in your system, will become better. Yeah? And you need to react accordingly. So what we have here is you need to uh, design the first time player experience, user experience. I think you as game developers, you know that. Yeah? So that's an important thing. You will have a lot of dropouts if this one is not perfectly designed. Then you need to give them an early game orientation. Yeah? What is really like, what are the mechanics of the game? How does it work? What is the overview? I don't want to feel overtaxed with too many things on the hut, for instance. Yeah? Then we have the mid-game repetition. So most of the games, successful games, they have in the mid-game, you do quite a lot of things in repetition. The core game loop that you're doing over and over again. Yeah? So you also this one needs to be designed properly. Then you have the late game maturity. So when the user is aware of all the mechanics that are in the game, perhaps already went through the entire story, now is aware of all the functionalities that are there, the skills and stuff, um, he has basically, he mastered or she mastered the game. And then afterwards, there's this phase that is oftenly skipped, too often is skipped, is the post-game creativity, I call it. Yeah, so once the entire game um, is, is played through, for instance, the story, you can think about opening up a space to unleash the creativity of the player. Yeah? Think about games like um, Minecraft or Valheim. Yeah? Those are perfect examples where people can unleash their creativity even though the entire story is already done and they experienced everything. They have their level 10 swords or whatever it might be. Um, give them a space, give them a sandbox where they can play with. And they will be also promoting your game with this because they want to share their creativity on Twitch, on YouTube, wherever. Yeah? So think of, don't skip this phase here. What I also do is, at the beginning, I focus on extrinsic motivators. Yeah? Extrinsic motivators, like the classics are point badges, leaderboards. Yeah? So why they're not, they're not a bad thing to do, but you have to be careful with them, because at the beginning, it is super motivating for the players, and they understand how your system works because it gives them direct feedback. Yeah, it's very good to give them orientation for your system, extrinsic re uh, motivators. But then, sooner or later, it will become boring for them. Well, another level, I'm already level 140. I don't really care if I'm level 141. Yeah? So here, I need to focus more on intrinsic motivators. Not purely, but step by step, hand in hand, I go from extrinsic motivators into intrinsic motivators. So where I unleash the creativity of the player. Okay, another project example that I want to show you is now a gamified e-learning that we did, or a gamified learning course for energy efficiency course, uh, uh, an, on energy efficiency in Vietnam. And what you can see already is that it doesn't really matter which topic you want to tackle. No matter if it's energy efficiency, good governance, you know, sustainable tourism, human rights, you can always use a game in order to enrich the player experience. So this was basically, uh, we, we were talking here about very dry topics. Yeah? You can see here, for instance, motors, drives and pumps, lightning, ventilation, air conditioning, and so on and so forth. So also very mathematical um, calculations that the players had to do here. However, we were also embedding the entire thing into a narrative. Yeah? So kind of a role play game where they go through the different stations and they need to speak to the people from the different areas of a fictitious company that doesn't exist. They, they're still here in this, in this magic circle playing around. And they're building up their own company. Here you see again, you know, we start with, with points to give them an overview and giving some direct feedback. But here they have the possibility to unlock new items in order to self-create their own factory. Yeah, so we give them here the space for creativity. They can share it with their friends. 
to see, okay, I already unlocked these legendary items and I arranged it like that, yeah? All of this was done within the limitations that we had of an Excel sheet. <laughs> so that was the thing we had to work with, an Excel sheet. So what you, uh, what you can also see out of this is gamification. It doesn't matter. You don't need to have a lot of money for it to develop a great whatever um, serious game or whatever. You can work within the limitations. You need to work within the limitations that you have. And basically, this is the next learning I want to tell you. So my job is basically finding the sweet spot here in the center. So once a donor organization or any uh, company from private sector approaches me, they tell me they are targets. They tell me, we want to train 10,000 people on this or that topic. We want to raise the awareness on this or that topic. Yeah? So the targets of the donor achieve so this is about the game concept. How can you translate the targets into the game design yeah, that you're doing? Then you have to check on the feasibility, working within the limitations. Is it doable in terms of time, budget, you know, and the resources that you're having? You always, you can have a great design, but it might not just be doable within the time frame of half a year or two years or whatever. Um, depends on, of course, the limitations you're working in. So you have to take care of this, but also the technical feasibility. You need to speak with the coders, with the illustrators. Is this doable within the given time frame? And you need to cut. You need to cut a lot in the feasibility. Yeah? Then desirability, also too often missed in these projects. Quite often we have the uh, effectiveness check, so are the targets achieved? Is it feasible? Yes, I can do it within two years or one year or half a year. But is it really desired by the user? Probably the people skip the analysis phase. Yeah? So is it really made for the user? Another exper uh, ex yeah, example I want to show you is gamification in Afghanistan. So one of the uh, toughest projects I, <laughs> I was working in in the last years. Um, so we created also a gamified uh, learning experience here um, for Afghan NGOs that are working on reforestation in Afghanistan, so re-greening Afghanistan. And we used a gamified e-learning course that is ba uh, mainly focused on narrative, yeah? because we also did a lot of research, of course, on the culture. We spoke to a lot of people um, from our target group, from the NGOs. We had a lot of Afghan people in our team. And storytelling, narrative works all over the world but especially in Afghanistan. This is the way like how they are uh, teaching people and delivering messages. Yeah? And Afghanistan is also such a complex um, yeah, country to work in because we have over 150 ethnic groups in one country. Yeah? So it's not the Afghans. You cannot say that. Yeah? So it's a, a huge mix of, of, of different yeah, subcultures. Yeah. So you have to be aware of this and be super sensitive about um, the, the concept. And this is the next learning I want to show you. How do we design games for such sensitive and complex contexts? So first of all, you are zooming out. You know, we have the human psychological core drives that are quite similar. Um, to all of us. Yeah? So we have, for instance, the Octalysis framework in gamification from Yukai Chow, who is speaking about the core drives, but we also have the self-determination theory by Deki and Ryan, speaking about the human basic needs you know, and the, the drives, basically, on autonomy, yeah? mastery, and also uh, social, social interaction, social relatedness. But also, we normally add a fourth one on purpose. Yeah? So, these are quite similar to all of us. We are all motivated by similar things. Of course, we are different. The different individuals are different. However, we as humans, we are quite similar. Then you zoom in. And then you think about the culture. And that's an important part, yeah? So especially when you work in, yeah, in, in a lot of different uh, contexts, then you tend to design games for yourself because you think they're cool. Uh, but again, this is not working. You need to understand the culture. 
what is culturally appropriate. Yeah? So the culture plays an important role, not only on a regional um, way or like uh, context or country context, but also if you work for the private sector within companies. Yeah? If you should, for instance, design an onboarding game for companies and uh, US game developers, this is a huge potential for you also to work in this sector, I can tell you. Yeah? So uh, don't only think of entertainment games for your future career. Also think about you know, using games for other things, serious games. For instance, in the private sector, I was just talking about onboarding, yeah? onboarding process. It can spare the company a lot of time and money to have one game that is working for, I don't know, their 200,000 employees. Yeah? But then you need not only to think about the culture of the, the target country, but also, of course, the culture of the company itself. Yeah? So that's also that's something to take into consideration. Then the target group, so zooming in further, the target group within the culture. It's, of course, a huge difference if you want to create, design a game for children or for CEOs or for males, females, of course, um, it's getting closer, you know, uh, males and females. However, there's still sometimes a um, differentiation that you can see. So within the target group, the culture within the, the target group within the culture is still an important thing. And then also the use case, this is also often skipped. So how does the situation look like where the target audience is interacting with your system, with your game? Yeah? Think about this. Are they playing the game in the bus? Perhaps in school, are they forced to play the serious game as part of the onboarding process? Or should they play the game in their free time? Yeah? So really think about like how and when are people interacting with the system? In rural areas, do they have access to internet? Uh, the game needs to be playable offline a in a lot of um, regions in the world. So, uh, OK, so all these things you need to take into consideration. And then um, I th the, yeah, well, another example here is serious games in Yemen. So Yemen is uh, supposed to be or called the, the biggest human catastrophe in the world. Yeah? So we have a lot of problems over there. And um, basically, we were not allowed to travel to Yemen to reach out to the people, to our target audience, because it's just too dangerous to, to travel there. Yeah? So we thought about, OK, how can we approach the people and our target group? And 70% of the population in Yemen is less than 30 years old. Yeah? So we have a huge target group that is used to play games. And we make, should make use of this. Yeah? So that's why we decided to, to create uh, eight serious games on, uh, with different approaches and um, for different target groups on nonviolent conflict transformation or peace support. Um, uh, Philip, sorry. Uh, so I'm just, this is just a timer thing. Ah. So we have uh, two minutes. OK, I'll quickly be, be, go through it. Then we can go through the question sure, and sure, answers. Sure, sure. OK, so basically, we created a lot of games together with them. They uh, established their own game design studio out of this as a consequence of this project. As mentioned, a lot of different uh, serious games with different game approaches that you can see here. We use different types of impact measurement, so hard numbers like the downloads, but you can also measure a lot of things in the game itself. So how do the user react to things in the game itself. You can also think about pre and post questionnaires. Did they change their attitude after playing the game? Yeah? So how are they behaving in the game and what does this say about the target audience? And the last one here is serious games on civic participation. This is something that we are doing with um, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, FES. So we want to speak about good governance and civic participation in 12 Arab countries. We're working together here with a company from um, uh, Lebanon and Jordan. Great guys. And um, this is basically the approach. There's a trailer of two minutes, but I think we cannot show it anymore. Time for Q&A. OK. So what do you think? Trailer or more questions? <laughs> trailer. OK, let's go for the trailer then. OK. This is how one of the games will look like. Year 2121. Climate disasters. 
armed conflicts and unethical technological and scientific progress have turned many parts of the Earth into desert and wasteland. A few remaining humans and two new intelligent species, robots and humanimals, are vying for domination and the power to dictate and shape the future of the planet. Divided into three camps, each driven by their values and beliefs, they are striving to dominate and make history. Camp One is inhabited by the heartless robots, hyper-smart, self-governed and disciplined machines. They are product of out-of-control technological innovation and have developed an artificial super-intelligence far superior to humans. Driven by big data, this camp aims at world and ultimately space hegemony, believing they alone can protect the Earth from takeover by extraterrestrials through technological progress, collectivism and expansionism. Camp 2 is home to the robust humanimals, genetically engineered. They are a crossbreed of intelligent humans and strong animals that can adapt to harsh environments. The humanimals in Camp 2 are constantly at work on improving their DNA to accelerate evolution. A strongly elitist society that strives for perfectionism and meritocracy. They despise robots and see humans as obsolete. They see the humanimals not aligned with their camp as traitors. Camp 3 is inhabited and jointly ruled by humans and friendly humanimals. Their highly ambitious plan is to revive Earth's glorious green days of mild climate, biodiversity and cultural brilliance and believe they can achieve this through environmentalism, tolerance and emotional intelligence. 2121, the massive online multiplayer game that unites and divides, breaks and builds, entertains and challenges. Join now. What camp will you choose? Build an active community and shape our brand new world. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, that's still work in progress. It will be published uh, next year. And this is like a way like how you can transform a quite dry topic such as good governance, you know, with different structures on how to 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 be part of a society like in a very playful approach, you know, like as a serious game. So here are my key takeaways and then I'm done. Um, first one that I want to remind you of, don't skip the analysis phase. That's so important, the analysis of the culture and the context and the target group, yeah? Don't think that you know everything already. Do the investment, speak to the people, do interviews and don't skip the analysis phase. Adapt your game to the culture and the context. I was speaking to it a lot already. And then early failure is not only okay, early failure is actually good. Yeah? So if you're prototyping and if you're testing and if you really speak to your target group with prototypes, then you will fail and that's a good thing. Yeah? Because then early in the process you can adapt and you can react quickly without a lot of costs or time involvement. So, Embrace early failures. That's also for your team culture, very important. Yeah? Then balance effectiveness, feasibility, and desirability. That was about the sweet spot. You know? And the last one is specifically in international cooperation or development cooperation. It is sustainability through ownership. Uh, so embrace the contributions from your target audience. Embrace the ownership and give them possibility to come up with their own ideas, give them this creative space. Think about intrinsic motivators in order to stimulate their activities and yeah, promote it. Sustainability through ownership. And yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, so yes, we have less time for questions, but we will get started, but luckily, Dr. Phillips around, so you all can also contact him after this. Yeah. Hi, Phillips. Hey. Uh, so my question is something to do with replayability. So I see most of the serious games are something like a one-time affair, like where when it comes to onboarding, right? Like you sometimes you're shooting guns and suddenly a question pops up, and it's something not to do with the theme, right? 
So the game is taking you out of reality at every point of time. A normal game takes you into a different atmosphere. It's an escape game, right? But whereas the serious games are taking us back to reality, back and forth, and I don't see much of the serious game as a replayable thing. And when you mentioned that replayability is a core thing, I want you to see how much of serious games are into replayability. Yes. Can handle on that. Very good question. Thank you so much. Um, serious game design is one of the hardest things to do, actually, because you need to combine the learning messages that are quite often dry and boring, quite often, not always with a fun experience. So you're not only designing a fun experience, but you need to integrate the learning messages into the experience itself. So don't go for a design which is sequential, thinking of, now it's fun time, fun time over, now you need to learn. Now fun time, now you need to learn. Don't go for this. Think about the learning content as meaningful content to progress in the game. It's also something that we see in all the entertainment games. You're getting challenges in these things. You need to learn about how to solve the challenge. And once you mastered it, then you can progress. So the learning how to, how to beat a boss fight or something is already in the game itself. And why are we not use, uh, make use of this in serious games? So we need to embed the learning content into the game design itself. That's so important and a very hard thing to do. Regarding replayability, I totally agree. Yeah, so quite a lot of games, serious games, are play. You can play through them once, which is also for some games quite okay. Yeah, if you say, yeah, perhaps it raised the awareness on, on the problems of migrants for me. I didn't know about this. Yeah, so for me, raising the awareness, I was reflecting on it, and serious games and behavior change. Serious games can only be like one step towards behavior change, but it needs to be a mosaic of different activities that you're doing to really achieve behavior change. Yeah? Um, so a serious game can help you to raise the awareness, you know, to kick the player um, out of his or her reality, to jump into the shoes of another one, to self-reflect on it, and it can also give them some assistance to, you know, to, to, to further learning. Yeah? But the, one serious game will not change the entire world. Another question, please. You can just try and say it out. back from that. Okay. Yeah, so the question was on sensitive topics, that we are speaking about sensitive topics in the game. And this is something you have to be also super careful, and that's why the analysis part is so important, that you think about all the stakeholders that are involved in the project and who, who you might offend with that game. That's about ethics again in games. Yeah? What do you want to achieve? The so-called, uh, so, something that we are doing always in every game is the so-called do no harm assessment. Yeah, so in every, um, every few steps in the concept, we're checking if we are harming like any, any group of people you know, with this. And then, of course, you need to be super careful on that. So be aware of that you as, a play, uh, you as a game designer, through the game, you are manipulating your player, or you, you influence your player, at least. And he or she will then also influence the world. So be aware of this. Think about do no harm assessments. Think about ethics in games. And uh, another question that I had was uh, on the development side. Uh, how, I mean, a lot of the issues that you are, you know, trying to solve or rather addressing through your games uh, might pertain to multiple countries, uh, multiple regions, right? So, how important is localization budgeting to you? Yeah. So localization for us is really key. We always try to. Uh, contextualize the game towards a certain country or region. Yeah, of course, in the African uh, examples that I showed you, we aimed on the entire continent. Of course, there it's, it's a bit different to, um, to really contextualize it. Think about like the added value of the localization of, the, um, um, of it. So if you have a game that can be played in a lot of different contexts, scaling up, it might be worth to have it kind of broad in terms of the culture in the game. Might be worth it. Yeah, if you think of upscaling. However, 
if you want to tackle a, a specific target group, for instance, within the country, you might need to, to, to adapt it to the culture. For instance, in the Yemen games, we were, uh, uh, we were um, cooperating with game studio from Yemen, artists, local artists, sound, and so on, because we wanted to make it a Yemeni experience. And that, that we didn't have the budget that other AAA titles might have. However, we were in the top three of the Play Stores because of the cultural adaption. Yeah? Be people were seeing that this game is done by Yemenis for Yemenis. And that's why they really loved this experience. Huh? Um, so we are running out of time because we are back. To, like, we have another talk starting in five minutes. Uh, if it's a quick question, we can yeah. try and just wrap it up quickly. Hi, hi Philip. Uh, I have a question where you are talking about uh, serious games, right? Yeah. So how are you are measuring that, like, you know, it has been given a consulting to you. So how you're measuring it like it has been achieved, uh, you know, uh, the target, what has been, you know, yeah. set to you. Yeah. So how you're doing that? So that's, that's the impact measurement of serious games. Yeah. And uh, we developed, it's kind of the holy grail of serious games. You know, it's something that, that everyone is striving for and really wants to achieve. Like how can you measure the impact of a game, yeah, of a serious game? And we thought about, okay, there's the, these hard numbers, such as download rates and stuff like this, and um, uh, basically impressions per millions and stuff like this, you know, all these, these things that you can get out of the stores. However, you need to think about more in detail, like what does it do to the player? So you can also think about uh, in-game questionnaires, like pre and post questionnaire, then a longitudinal questionnaire after three months, you know, did this awareness raising took place um, did the self-reflection took place? You can think about in-game experiments where you have different target audiences or target groups within or testing groups within the game itself. And based on different information that you give them, you check on their reactions within the game. The game is the nice thing that we can measure everything that you do in the game. Yeah? So we just need to design it accordingly. Another one that I uh, created was the so-called real-life challenges. So for instance, a school, Again, taking here the Yemen example, uh, we were thinking about, okay, what are good environments for learning? Yeah? And we were speaking about this in the game itself. And then we said, okay, now you kick, we kick you out of the magic circle. The self-reflection started. What are the three things that you could improve in your own school? Yeah? And with this, they start reflecting on the learning content. They're not only consuming and interacting with it, but they transfer it into their own situation yeah? and reflecting on it. And you can measure this also, like how they are reacting to it, either on a quantitative basis or qualitative basis. And the mixture of all these different impact measurement systems that you build in the game then give you a hint, at least, if you um, achieved your goals. Thank you so much. Uh, we will have to close here.